So thank you so much, Thorsten, um, and for everybody that is here on this, this early morning, um, and even to those that will be joining us uh, via the Zoom, uh, greetings and, and welcome. So how am I, how I've structured what I'm going to be talking about today, I briefly want to explain our story. And when I explain our story, I will be explaining to you a bit of uh, who I am briefly, and how do I integrate that into what it is that we do um, at uh, Grace Generation Recovery Center, because most of what we do has, has come through, through uh, personal experience, and uh, the overarching element is actually that um, it's, it's, it's a biblical view on how we address um, the matter of addiction. And today's topic, we'll be looking at, you know, how do we engage the difficulties um, on addiction? The way we've actually structured our vision and our mission is actually on engaging with that, that difficulties. So a bit briefly about who I am. Uh, my name is Esther. I am, I am a father. Um, I am a, a, a pastor. I am a son. Um, I am also a congregational member in our church as much as I am a pastor as well. Uh, I, have, I have been given the privilege um, to be called by God to be able to share uh, what God speaks about through his word, to engage with families uh, and individuals, communities that find themselves battling in the area of substance abuse. Um, I myself come from a past of addiction. I'm not going to go into length about what my past looked like in addiction, but briefly stated the norm, the norm of somebody in addiction, um, exposed to the wrong things from a young age. Uh, I came from a, from a fairly good home. Um, I, I, it's not to say that our home was perfect, but there were some challenges within the home, some of which steered me to a place of dependency to find some sort of a coping mechanism as an option out from some of the underlying issues. And I'm going to be talking about that uh, a little bit in a moment, some of the underlying issues that led me to this place of, 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 of dependency. Um, from a young age, I can remember everything that was wrong. And there's this bad boy picture that youngsters have in mind. And uh, when I was growing up, I, I saw myself in this bad boy picture. And I'm, that, that must be weird to want to grow up to actually desire to be one day a bad boy, you know? Um, but growing up and being exposed to the type of communities that we have in our, our local environments, I think it's safe to say that, that that would be the norm for a lot of the youngsters. Uh, a lot of bad choices, um, a lot of underlying challenges, a lot of things that happened to me from a young age that led me to a place of dependency. My wrong choices led me to a place where it was even difficult for family to have me around. Um, it's the norm with an addict. You have somebody that is in your home that is in addiction. You need to watch where you put your hand back. You need to watch where you put your cell phone. Um, I can remember even being rejected by certain family members and even to a point where I wouldn't even be allowed to even visit certain family members. And even when they would come and visit uh, my mom, they would be wary about where they put their belongings, knowing that there's an addict uh, in the family. I, uh, in 2012, was uh, on the streets at the time. And uh, while I was on the streets, another friend of mine, uh, we were speaking about, about, about church. This friend of mine's father was a pastor. And I was quite curious about a lot of questions that I had because my experience and exposure to church was mainly just my mom forcing me to go to church. You know, my mom would force me and, uh, you know, be sitting there at the back. And somehow, some way, it's, it's almost as if every time the pastor spoke, it, it was as if he was speaking to me and directing his attention at me. But that was my only exposure to church. I had so much questions. And being so curious that this friend of mine, Actually, his, his dad is a, is a pastor. I had so much questions. And while I'm asking him all these questions, an evangelist so happens to pull up and engages with me and my friend. This evangelist had been a former uh, a, a gang and uh, a former drug dealer, former gang member and drug dealer. And it was interesting for me to see someone that had come from an area of brokenness in his life. Um, had struggled with his identity that he had um, in the communities and, uh, and, and, and finding ways and means to provide for himself and his family in all the wrong ways had changed their life around. So for me, it was intriguing. 
And nevertheless, what was more intriguing was the message that he was bringing me. This is some of the words that he shared with me. He said, he knows what I'm going through. He's been where I've been. He understands what it feels like to be rejected to an extent that I have. And he would like to help me. His concerns was quite basic for me. Did I wash? You know, you know the people on the streets and in addiction haven't had a bath in a couple of days. So his, his concerns and his cares for me was, you know, have I, have I washed? Um, and he wanted to take me to unite me with my family. We're going to look at that in a moment, what it looks like to really engage with somebody that is in addiction. But even in engaging with somebody that is in addiction, what are some of the challenges that we can even have around helping um, uh, someone in addiction? I think it's safe to say at this point in, in many of our lives, we know someone that we can think of at this moment in our families, uh, maybe even our church or, or somebody even within our counseling groups that has a relative that is battling in the area of addiction. And it's safe to say that at this point, some of them have tried certain methods, certain strategies in order to bring forth the help to the person in addiction. And the reality is this, that the statistics of the recovery rate of people in addiction is quite shocking. Well, what we do and why we do it is purely this. At some point in history, God, through his grace, through the redemptive message of the person of Jesus Christ, laying down his life at the cross of Calvary, became relevant in my life. So to say, the revelation of God's grace became relevant in my life. That draw an addict to become a disciple. And it's from that discipleship that I had experienced, moving from addiction to a place of, of a discipleship, that I had the desire to help people that were also battling in the same area that I found myself in. It took one person to walk up to me while I was on the streets to engage with me, to love and to care for me, um, displaying the love of Christ towards me. And it's that same gratitude that I want to display towards others. But yet again, there's also some challenges with that. Well, that's why our center exists today. Some point in history, God had redeemed an addict and made that addict a disciple. Had taken me out of a place of brokenness to a place of sanctification in his grace for his glory. That's why our center exists today. It's actually not about just me yelping people in addiction, but it's us as the body of Christ coming together to glorify God in our care, our commitment, and our devotion to one another. Well, this leads me to my next point this morning, and it's on what our vision and our mission is. And while I break up our vision and our mission, I will actually break up what some of the challenges are. So here's our vision statement. Our vision statement at Grace Generation Recovery Center is this, to provide an affordable, gospel-centered recovery and support program for individuals and families in South Africa. So what do we mean by provide and affordable? One of the biggest challenges that I see is being able to help and care for those that are in addiction, being able to house them. And let me explain to you why this is a challenge. We come from an area where addiction is so rife and a lot of the people that need the help and care can't afford it. You know, I am very skeptical sometimes when somebody comes in my office and they say, you know, we, we won't be able to, to afford this. And I'm skeptical to say, yeah, but you can afford your addiction, can't you? You know, they can wait, make, make ways and means. But the reality is the ways and their means of providing for the addiction is not the right ways and means of providing for the addiction. Now, why is this a challenge? This is a challenge because... The majority of the people that need help out there don't have the means to make it into programs such as ours. So why do we say provide and affordable? It's because we're willing to see as a ministry, what can we do in terms of fundraising? What can we do to make it possible for even those that can't afford? Let me give you an example, okay? Uh, a lot of people, especially those that we see that are living on the streets that are battling in addiction, are using heroin. And they are spiking this heroin. And uh, the, the, in order to get somebody in a program like ours, they first require a medical detox. So our program doesn't deal with the medical side 
of addiction, we deal more with the practical day-to-day -day living, um, the recovery, discipleship uh, aspect of addiction. I'm going to touch on that again in a moment. So we don't deal with the medical aspect of it. But here's the reality. Uh, the person that is on the streets that needs care in order to detox before they can get into a program like ours, if they don't get the medical attention that they need, what happens is their body goes cold turkey. So they get shivers. They can literally dig their nails deep into their flesh, remove their skin as they're digging out to make their way to their bone. The body is going off into uh, cold shivers and sweats. And to see somebody in that state, they are unable to move. Uh, they can't even make it to the kitchen to eat. So this is the norm with somebody that is using heroin. Now, treatment in order to help somebody that is using heroin ranges anything from a thousand rand a day to a program that would be about 21 days. So we're looking at 21,000 rand for a month to help somebody medically just for a month that comes from heroin. But the question there would be, how do we actually help this person? Now, why is this a challenge and why should we think and address it? Well, this is a challenge because you find that a lot of the guys that are using heroin are guys that are living on the streets. These are the guys that need to support the addiction and they uh, resort to matters such as crime. Uh, one that is, 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 is famous today and I'll let you in on a local term if you've never knew the term that is used for it, it's called Dopa Dopa. Okay, so the term Dopa Dopa is actually used for the guys that walk around and collect plastics out of your dustbin and they've got this big trolley uh, that they pull around and they've got all this plastic in it. Those guys, now what they call, what they do is dopa dopa. So these guys have this occupation in order to find ways and means to support their addiction. So our recovery program tries to see from a ministry stance, what can we do in order to help and to care for the person that is unable to go to such a program. So we try and network with a lot of people. We try and network with a lot of churches in order for us to make it possible for us to be a place that can help people within the community that really can't afford it. So that's what it means by providing affordable. But then what does it mean by gospel-centered recovery and support program? Well, we believe and our stance in approaching addiction is Christocentric. Now, what we mean by that is we use the message of Christ that brings redemption from our sin and brings us into a loving, caring relationship with God. And we then in the process of sanctification through the Spirit of God at work in and through the life of a believer. So our strategy in approaching addiction is twofold. Number one, the grace of God. And number two, the mercy of God. Now, why the grace and why the mercy? And this is it, the grace of God, because ultimately at the end of the day, the act in and of itself of dependency is idolatry. That act in and of itself requires redemption from addiction, not just recovery from addiction. Now, what we mean by redemption from addiction is this. Uh, the person that is battling in addiction has by their actions rebelled from God, has offended God by committing this sin. But here's the reality. All of us are guilty of it. The Bible teaches us there is none that is righteous. No, not one. All have gone astray. All have fallen short of the gracious standard of our God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Which, which is funny because when we approach addiction, understanding that it's actually a sin issue, we realize that the addict struggles from the same thing that we do. Sin. And here's the reality. In order to change the aspect of sin, we need to come to the one that has dealt with sin. And that's our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ at the cross. The way we do this is we do daily devotions, one in the morning, one in the evening. And all of our projects that we offer um, throughout the week is all constructed around biblical principles in order to disciple the person in addiction. How do they fight temptation? Um, how do they deal with the shortcomings? How do they deal with the underlying issues? Which is what leads us to the mercy of God. Because it's that mercy of God that is able to show empathy towards the person. As much as they have wronged God by the action, God redeems them. But God also through the Holy Spirit brings comfort and restoration into the life 
of the individual and their families. So our method is simple, Christocentric. We use the gospel, we use the grace of God and the mercy of God. So we provide an affordable, gospel-centered recovery and support program for individuals and families in South Africa. Now, what is some of the challenges that one would have around this? There's a TED talk, it's quite a familiar TED talk. Um, it's, you can easily find it on, on, on YouTube. Uh, I struggle with the pronunciation of the individual's name, so, so please uh, show, me, show me grace with this one. <coughs> but his, his name is uh, Johan or Johan uh, Harris. And he does this amazing talk and it has Yao framed the way that I actually approach my care towards people that God brings along my pathway. The title of his TED talk is this, everything you think you know about addiction is wrong. This is that everything you think you know about addiction is wrong. So I want to present to you today this, this, this um, engagement that he has. So he, he had a, fam, a lot of family members that was battling in the area of addiction and really desiring to want to love and care for them. He then under, uh, underwent a long uh, study on what addiction actually is and uh, how do you help care. And he uses two studies that was done. Uh, the one study that he uses was called the rat cage experiment. Now, the rat cage experiment um, was what, what, what was conducted and it's actually how it's framed how a lot of people view addiction. It's where some of these terms and these concepts comes once an addict, always an addict. You know, that it's an uncurable disease and you can't do anything to change it. Okay, so I'll, let, me, let me say, let me say and bring it forward now, maybe that that's not the method that we use using the biblical worldview. We don't believe once an addict, always an addict, and we don't believe it's an uncurable disease. But it's this rat cage experiment that brought that. So what they done was they took two rats, they put the rats in the cage and they put one bowl with water and one bowl uh, with water <clears throat> laced with either heroin or cocaine. So there's two rats, two bowls, and there's only, so to say, two options that you have given. The one is water, and the one is water with heroin. This rat cage experiment resulted in a 100% overdose. The, the, the rat cage experiment was later on revisited, and this was the concept when it was revisited. And it was said this, what if it's not about the rat? Because now what we mean by what if it's not about the rat is because uh, we look at the concept and we say once an addict, always an addict. And the assumption is once somebody gets exposed to addiction or, or becomes uh, a person that is in active addiction, okay, once they reach that point, they can never come to. They can never come out of that place of dependency. Okay, so, so that's where that, 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 that mindset comes from, once an addict, always an addict. But then when it was revisited, this is how it was approached. What if it's not about the rat, but it's actually about the cage? What if we can change something about the options that is given to the person in addiction? What if it's about the options of how we help, love and care for the person in addiction? What if we have to change from just giving them the water with the water and heroin to maybe some other things? So then what was, what was constructed by a professor, they changed it from, from the red cage experiment to the red park experiment. They then put uh, the water, the water laced with either heroin or cocaine, then they put cheese, and then instead of just the two rats, they put more rats, it was a bigger park, there was more things for them to do, there was uh, some balls for them to roll around to play with, there was some interaction in procreation that they were able to even do with one another, which resulted in many more and many more and many more rats. And this is what happened. The experiment went from the from 100% overdose to a 100% success rate. Now, here's the funny thing. You would think, okay, if we have to put that into the norm of how we live our lives and how we treat people that is in addiction, what do we need to change? And when you think of what is it that we need to change and you think of the opportunities and options we need to give to people in addiction, it almost kind of like seems, seems to be something that is impossible. 
But here's the funny thing. Portugal done it. Portugal revisited their laws on addiction. Portugal actually went and they said, what if we implement this sort of change into our communities? At that point in time, Portugal was having one of the biggest drug uh, challenges in the world. And they had a lot of people that was getting arrested. So people were put into prison because of either possession um, or either under the influence of narcotics. So what they had done was they said, what if it's a way that we can approach helping the person that is in addiction to have better opportunities in life? So what they done was they changed their laws. Then they had found work for people to do. For an example, if the person was a mechanic, um, what they would do is if the person comes through a recovery program, instead of um, instead of just labeling the person or, or giving uh, the, the, the person, uh, you know, when somebody comes out of prison, you now have this uh, record that you are working with you. So instead of leaving the person to just have a record, they would try and find help for the person long term. So this is what they done. They gave people in addiction money. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad my mom didn't hear about that. I was in active addiction. <laughs> Giving me money was not what I needed there and then. But listen to this. They not only gave them money, but they gave them job opportunities. Now, this is one of the things that was revisited. What if it is not about the rat, but what if it is about the cage? Well, here's the thing. Portugal implemented this, this change within its structures and it reduced the rate of addiction, it reduced the rate of crime, and it reduced the rate of AIDS. Now you'll ask, how so? Well, here's the reality. Sometimes people that are battling in the area of addiction have no other connections to make in life. So they are limited to the only options that we have given them, water and water with heroin. Now, I will say this from the get-go that I do think that it's not something that is applied for each and everyone. Um, because if you work with people in addiction, uh, it's safe to say that we can use this term, uh, different strokes for different folks. Not every person uh, needs the exact same Yelp and treatment. But one thing that I can say to you that I've even observed, what if it's not about relapse prevention? Hear me out. What if it's not about relapse prevention? But what if it's about reintegration process? Now, what do we mean by that? You see, one of the challenges that we have, especially in our communities, by the time an individual finds himself on the opposite end of the table in my office, the person at that point in time has probably been to prison. So they've got a record, okay? Um, they, they, they've probably been married, divorced, got kids, They've, they've, they've messed up their CV, or if they've never even made it that far in life. You know, I, got a, I got a call, I actually have a meeting uh, today to meet with another organization where they're trying to find help for minors that are battling an addiction. So they're looking for a place to house minors that are battling an addiction. They, even, they haven't even had the opportunity to build a CV yet or even make it to matric. But they're already in a place of dependency in their life. So, so what if we change the limited options that a lot of people in addiction have? Now, why is this a challenge? And how do we engage with this challenge? Well, the reason why it's a challenge is this. There's no use in we helping somebody off addiction for a period of time, but sending them back to the limited options that led them down the pathway of dependency to begin with. So it's not just our system of housing the person that comes from addiction, but it's about our system that we use to reintegrate this person back into society. I've seen this in the amount of years that I've been helping people in addiction. Many programs work. I mean, many programs work. The success rates of people graduating from recovery programs or rehabs is great. It's honestly great. But the success rate of people remaining sober once they've left those rehabs is where the challenge is. So we shouldn't address the system of how are we housing the people in addiction. We've got that right. We need to address the system of how do we reintegrate these individuals back into society. Well, 
That challenge actually leads me to our mission. Well, here's our mission statement. Provide an affordable recovery program that empowers the individual to develop life skills, to reintegrate them back to society and sustain sobriety. One of the things that I've not noticed is if the system and the structure in the home hasn't changed, it makes it very difficult for the person that has now experienced sobriety to come back into a home where they haven't been able to be able to forgive the individual. They're still holding on to the memories of the hurt and the pain of what this person has done, what this person has said. And now you take that person and you put them they're sober back into this home. But there's this thing that we call triggers. And now they're in a home and here's a trigger about their past, a reminder about their past that is continuously presented to them. Now the way we combat that at our recovery center is we do family intervention. When we do family intervention, we equip the families with what they need. Because here's the reality. It's not only the person that is in addiction that has been hurt, but it's even some of these family members that has also been hurt. You see, there's a system even at home that needs to change. I can remember when I was younger uh, and growing up, and I actually love using this example. Um, my, my father loved uh, sports, and, and something that I observed from a young age is that in our communities, this is normally what happens. Man United versus Liverpool. And I'm not a soccer person, so I don't know who's playing who now. I have absolutely no clue. All I know um, is there was a team Man United and there was a team Liverpool. And my father was a Man United supporter. And, and, and when I was young, I observed this. Most of the places that you go to, before they even, before the hype and the celebration of the actual game itself, people will normally do this. They will get prime meat and they will get a bottle. Or if it's not a bottle, maybe a case beers. Subconsciously, what we are teaching our youngsters from a young age is that in order to enjoy the norms of life, we need some sort of an influence to our happiness. Now you take someone that comes from that area of dependency and you reintegrate them into a society that is teaching them dependency. You see, engaging the challenge of addiction is us being able to not only engage the person that is in addiction, but the options that we give them and the lifestyle and the culture that is based around addiction. Now, here's the funny thing. It might seem to be a goal that we can never ever reach or we can never ever achieve. But I present to you Portugal. Portugal has implemented laws, strategies and systems in order to bring forth reintegration processes to help facilitate and accommodate the person that comes from dependency and reintegrate them back into society. The crime rate has changed. The, the rate of addiction has changed. Now, what am I saying with all of this? Well, this is the crux of the matter. What are we collectively doing to be able to help those people that come from the area of addiction? One of the things that we do in terms of skills development in our recovery center is this. We're very big on life coaching. Uh, we get the person to understand uh, where their limitations are and we get the person to understand how do you now uh, become, I'll use this term and, 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 and I'll explain it, successful. And successful, not just in a way of, of taking yourself from a broken place to succeeding in life, but how can you actually use simple strategies in your life day to day that is able to bring forth long lasting change. And, and here's, here's the next thing. Sometimes we think that such thoughts might even be not biblical, but here's the reality. God calls us from our broken state to a state of sanctification. We call that recovery for the person who is addiction. Recovery is a term that we use that is actually this sanctification. It means this God is working in and through the person. That person needs to take accountability, initiative, and ownership over their life. And here's the thing how are we going to be able to give that person something to be accountable to if we want to remove all of that from them? If we want to just put them one side and exclude them out of society. It's almost as if to say our loved ones that is in addiction, the way that we deal with the problem is removing them from the equation and isolating them. 
But the isolation aspect doesn't work. It hasn't worked in the past and it's not working in the present. So we can't assume that it's going to work for us in the future. We need to think outside of this box using the message of God's redemption. And here's the thing. I believe this, that us as the church, as the body of Christ, have a plus to this. Because here's the reality. We have the message of redemption. And we have now the practical tools of day-to-day -day living and the work of God in the life of a believer that the Bible even presents to us as a way, a means, and a method of being able to reintegrate this person back into society. The person is able to think about a future. The person is able to forget about those shortcomings of the past, be redeemed by God, and reunited with family, reconciled with family. And here's the reality. We need to afford them more opportunities. Instead of limiting them, once they have recovered, we need to actually be there to support them. What do we really do to support people? that come from the area of addiction. We do learnerships in our, in our program. We are currently busy with a, with a welding course that we offer to not only to the guys that is in um, uh, our facility, but we even offer it um, to, to people in the community. At the moment, we have uh, 50 learners that is busy doing welding. Uh, it's an NQF uh, 2, level 2, so, so it's, it's, it's quite a good course. Uh, they get 91 credits from it. That brings so much joy to my heart, thinking that somebody can come to me off the street and leave my premises with sobriety, salvation, and a certificate in their hand of some sort of a trade and some sort of a skill that they can use. But here's the reality. Are we ready to accept such a person once they come back to your home? See, engaging the challenges of addiction is not just for one person for, to do, but it's for us collectively to do. There's an amazing book that is written by uh, David Hay that is called The Heart of an Addict. And in David Hay's approach to this, he says, what do you see when you see a person that is in, addict in addiction? Do you see the person that has loss of weight? That's awesome. Do you see the person that you're ready to hide your handbag or your cell phone away from? Because you know they have a dependency and you need to make sure they don't get their hands on your belongings. Or do we see a person that somehow, some way, in a period of their past, has experienced some underlying issues and they've just found a coping mechanism you see, when we approach not what we see outwardly as the symptoms of addiction, but we approach it as the root of addiction, we are able to love and to care more for the person that is in addiction. What we normally see in our communities and in our families is the fruit of addiction. But when we look at the root of addiction, I believe that the Bible encourages us. I believe that the Bible challenges us on what is our approach in order to care for them. Remember what Paul the Apostle says um, in, in Timothy, uh, not, not in Timothy, sorry, in, in, in Corinthians. He, he, he says this, praise be to God, um, our Lord, uh, uh, praise be to our Lord Jesus Christ uh, and God, his Father, okay, who comforts us in our distresses, and listen to this, so that we may comfort others. We are recipients of the comfort of God, but we are also the vessel that God wants to use in order to bring that comfort to the next. How do we make a distinguishing factor between who is our neighbor and who is not our neighbor? Are we going to be like the priest that sees somebody beat up, struck down on the side of the road and walks on the opposite side of the road? Or are we going to be the one filled with compassion, ready to help them? Here's the reality. Just like at our worst sake in our life of sin, Jesus came to help us and take us to his aid. Are we ready as a people, as a community, as a church, to start thinking about what is the processes and the methods that we can do to help this reintegration processes? The heart of an addict. Is it, is it about the rat, or is it about the cage? 
Should we revisit it and remove that cage and create for them a park? And what might that changes look like in our communities, in our families, or maybe even in our very own lives? A very good friend of mine attended a uh, church service and after giving an amazing sermon, uh, he then done according to the traditions of his denomination, uh, I out to call and he would call people forward uh, to, 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 to say this prayer. And after this, this is what he, he engaged on. He says when he was done praying for the people, he then asked the congregation a question. He said, if there's anyone here that is battling in the area of addiction, or you have a family member, I would like to pray for you. This is what shocked me. The entire congregation stood up. You see, sometimes addiction is more closer to us than what we think. And maybe for us now, we can escape the norms of it. But here's the reality. What is our future looking like? And how can we using biblical strategies, basic discipleship, normal principles and opportunities in order to bring long-lasting change that would help change the lives of people around us. I can't but help to think about this. It might seem like a reality that is far-fetched for us, but I can't stop thinking that there's a place, Portugal, has implemented strategies in order to change it. I'm sure by now um, it sparked a lot of maybe even controversy. It has sparked maybe even a lot of a lot of question marks. And that is why, um, you know, for a moment, I would like to hand it over to you. And, um, you know, if you have any questions, uh, please do engage with me so I can graciously answer them. Amen. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Are you, and then you're still going to say something at the end or? Um, that's, 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 that's about it. So I wanted to leave some room for, for, for some good Q&A. Okay. Good. Thank you. So much. Um, so uh, um, people on Zoom, the, the room can hear you, so you can also unmute and, and speak. Uh, or otherwise, we so start with the room. Yes. You mentioned TED Talk, and it might have been the same one, where they gave the example of the um, soldiers from Vietnam. Yes, the same one. Is it? Yeah. And I, if, I, if I remember correctly, most of them were addicted to heroin and maybe other. Yes. Um, and there were essentially two groups. There were those that underwent treatment and those that didn't undergo treatment. But there was a very interesting result because even amongst those that didn't undergo treatment but had great social support, family support, some of them were able to come out of it without, you know, on their own. They just yes. seem to, you know, it seems to confirm what you're saying. Yeah, the, the, if my memory serves me well, but I stand to be under correction, I think the success rate was 95%. It was very high. It was 95% of people um, that was able to, because of family structures and support, was able to uh, be sober or not go back to, 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 to this usage because of the support system. And there was that very minimum of that 5% that, that they went, went back. Um, which is very, very interesting. And those are the type of things that spark that, that, that flame in my heart to think of there is something that we need to address in order to help facilitate this reintegration. And it starts with that support system. Thank you for that. What did, uh, what did COVID do to this picture? Uh, I can't imagine it having been, a, been of help. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so I'll, I'll share a personal story on that. Um, so, so I've, I, I had a, 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 my own business. Um, I had a barber shop and then I moved from having just the one to, 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 to opening another one. And I'm quite good with my hands. It's, it's always been, I always say it's, it's been one of the best methods that God has, has brought provision in my life was giving me the skill to be able to be a barber and to style, style people's hair. And when we had the center, I, funny enough, I opened the barber shop a month before we opened the center. And then we had the recovery center. And what I was doing was I was giving people that came from our center opportunities of work. So I was trying to provide employment as well as a place of abode for them. 
um, in terms of the, the integration. So there was some that, 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 that was working and then coming back uh, to the center thereafter. And it helped us also offer support to them um, as a support group. So we have a lot of support groups, uh, long-term structures that we use to help them. But how did COVID affect that? Uh, when COVID came, uh, power shops were unable to, 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 to continue to function. And you know, there's, it's, it's nice for us to talk about all the success and the positive aspect of it. But there's also the challenging aspect. I had lost all the stuff that I had yelled. In the period of, of COVID, we were unable to work, we were unable to function. A lot of them had to go back into uh, their, their, their families, uh, to their homes, where there wasn't some support structures and systems. And unfortunately, they had to make ways and means to continue to provide for themselves. And I also in turn lost a support system that I had to provide uh, some sort of financial support to, to, to these individuals that came. So, so COVID definitely comes to, 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 to challenge that. Um, again, in the same breath, it, it makes me think of, so my mind always goes into action mode, okay, what is the solution to this? So it again brings me to the point of what are some of the things that, that COVID has really taught us? And what are some of the things that we can do to implement certain change and, 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 and things like that? You know, so uh, COVID, COVID has came to bring a lot of challenges even within that. And I believe that it, it does disrupt the flow of those things. And then all we have to do now is to revisit the drawing board and ask, okay, what is the other systems or strategies that we can do in order to incorporate some sort of a change? May I have another? Yeah, <laughs> please do. <laughs> and, and, and then a Zoom question. Um, all right. Um, I'm involved with an NGO called the Character Company, which mentors boys with absent fathers. Right. And it seems that boys that grow up with absent fathers or a positive male role model in their life, the much higher incidence of drug addiction, incarceration, uh, bullying, women abuse, et cetera, et cetera. So I was just wondering if as part of, especially with males, as part of the recovery process, whether there is, with the consideration has been given to providing them with what might have been missing, and that is things that validate them as men. Yeah, 100%. Uh, when, when, when we do our support groups with the guys, and the guys open up to us, the thing that always breaks my heart is that some of the underlying issues is the fact that they haven't had that figure in their life. So it's greatly contributed to the choices that they've made and some of them actually going off um, into, into, into addiction. We have a, a, a course that is called Redemption from Addiction, where we, we, we now find um, it, it, the, the lesson is called family input. And we explain to them the importance of family input. We also explain to families the importance of family input, but we also try to create some sort of a structure and a base in order to help disciple uh, these guys. The challenge in that is um, we don't have such a large team. We don't have a lot of a lot of men within our ministry that is ready to take on that. And that is something that I've even been doing, uh, trying to find a lot of support from a lot of churches and ministries and having more people come uh, within our ministry to speak to them and to offer up some sort of a discipleship and things like that. But I do think that it will greatly help if we can on a larger scale reach that gap that is missing to be able to offer them that, that support. Um, and, 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 and guys long for that, you know, boys long for that, men long for that. Um, I even in my life at times, you know, I, I really long for that. So it's very, very important to offer that support to them um, and to network with people as well that is able to offer such type of a support because it, it, it would really help you know, those stats arise a bit. Thank you. Nathalie. Hi, good morning, everyone. I just have a question about um, the traditional concept of hitting rock bottom. Um, sort of, I always was kind of raised with the understanding that if you're dealing with an addict, um, sometimes helping too much until they've hit rock bottom is sort of counterproductive. And I just wanted to get your take on that, whether the idea of community needs to come in before or whether that concept is still valid? Uh, very great question. 
it's it's one I myself even wrestle with. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Uh, so thank you for that, Natalie. We do another teaching. We have teachings for everything in our ministry. Uh, we do another teaching that is called the difference between love and tough love, and the difference between uh, support and enabling. And the challenge is sometimes a lot of families don't realize that they are enabling. Um, I'll give you an example. We don't, uh, when we do family support uh, groups, we don't encourage families to prematurely uh, give too much compensation. Now, what I mean by too much compensation, sometimes guys can be in our, in our program and what they need is, is emotional support and not at that point in their life, financial support. The financial support will maybe come later on when they, they need a white shirt to go for an interview uh, or they need a lift to go for the interview. That's where that financial support can come in or maybe providing for them to go and learn a trade. But the challenge that we see is sometimes the family wants to compensate or if the family realizes that they've maybe aided to this addiction, they want to compensate and they end up enabling instead of actually giving support. So I do believe in, in, in the concept called rock bottom. Um, and I'll explain to you why. Uh, when the person has, has we, we, we need to find strategies and ways to help the person. That support, I do believe, comes after the person has made the, the wrong decisions because we now offering a system of support to that person that has made the wrong, the wrong decision. Um, let me explain to you what I mean by that. So my brother uh, can remember now when he, was, when he was in school, there was a school that came to bring drug awareness. And here's the reality, he never ever knew that drugs could actually help you um, if you are going through some things. And he sat there listening to them and he thought, mm, this might be cool. So it actually aided the thought of him wanting to go and try out, to go and use uh, drugs. So sometimes approaching it before they even get to that place might not even help because there is a lot of people that end up using anyway. But what we want to do is how do we support the person now that they've used? And why I believe in rock bottom is this. A lot, a lot of times, if it's not help that the person wants for themselves, it becomes very difficult in order to offer that help to them. Um, and that is where it brings the challenge again um, to, to how we help uh, people in addiction. Because if the person doesn't want that help, we can put strategies in place. But when people ask me, you know, what, what does the success rates look like? I say it's 100% if the person wants it. So there has to be an onus on the person actually wanting uh, this. You know, I, can, I can go and study uh, motor mechanics, but if I don't want to be a mechanic, you know, and, and, and in our program, we help the individual discover uh, what they want to do in their future. We help them put goals together. We help them integrate that into their family. Um, we do reintegration where they can spend some time with their family and communicate this with their family so that they are all well aware of, okay, where do I see myself? What, are, what am I good at? What would I like to learn? So the family can help support that. But it's difficult to offer that to somebody that doesn't want it. And here's, here's the nice thing about rock bottom. Rock bottom, uh, normally the depiction is uh, once the person has fallen. But this is what I say to people. Once the person has fallen, there's only one place up from there. And that is up. Because once they have fallen, it's not like they can fall more. They've fallen. But now there is an opportunity for them up again. And now we're looking at, okay, how do we help this person to get up again? Yeah. Um, there's another question um, typed in. Uh, basically around um, compare men men and women. So how does addiction in men compare uh, to addiction in women in terms of um, the incidence rate, in terms of impact, and in terms of how it presents? Um, okay, thank you. I'm gonna, I, I hope I'm understanding the question correctly. So, so just, is, yeah. it, is it different, men, yeah. men and women? So, 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 so what I've even noticed is there's, there's, there's similar underlying uh, challenges. Um, there's, there's the issue of uh, the lack of a parental figure that always presents itself. And then something that, 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 that I've seen, I mean, this is from my own personal study, um, especially with the woman, there's been a very big impact from a young age with cases of rape. So a lot of the women that actually come reaching out for help, um, I don't want to give statistics on our own because it's so close to home, 
and, and I wouldn't want to feel like you know, I'm putting anybody's business out there. Uh, but, I, but I'll say this, majority of the people that we've yelled, the ladies, come from a background of rape. A majority of the guys that we yell come from a background of a lack of a father figure and even uh, with, with the ladies as well. So there's, there's, there's a lot of similarities to it, um, the lack of a parental figure. But it seems like there's some things that is common uh, with, with, with the ladies that is not as, as common uh, with, with, with the guys. So the other thing that I've seen, and this is, this is only speaking from our uh, facility, is a lot of ladies actually don't come out looking for help. You know, our, our ladies section, uh, we don't always have a lot of girls that are, that are booking in. And, and, and this is relevant not only for ours, I'm speaking from ours, but experience in other places that have worked as well. There's been a lot of, a lot of uh, guys. So let's say the facility can house 30. You only have 25 guys and you have five ladies. So for some reason, a lot of ladies don't reach out um, for this help unless there's some sort of an intervention that we do in order to approach or target uh, just, just females. Yeah. I hope I understood the question correctly. I'm going to step right into this and we can cut this out of the recording. Um, <laughs> what do you, what do you think of, um, um, you know, deliverance services and things like that? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> now that you've mentioned it, um, deliverance services. So uh, what, what I say is the, the issue is with the term deliverance already. Uh, in, in, in our current South African concept of church, uh, deliverance is, is, is seen as the casting out of a demon, you know, deliverance service. But uh, in the actual concept of uh, the biblical understanding of deliverance, it's being translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. So deliverance would actually mean salvation, but, but what we see today is, 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 is what churches are performing as deliverance is uh, the casting out of demons. So here's my thing, okay? Uh, there's, there's a lot of, we, we had, we had uh, some services in the past and I have a lot of friends um, from ministry and they know, you know, even if they're listening to this, they know it's something that I'm bold on. So all of them know my view on this. It wouldn't be even a shocker to them. Um, we always hear yeah, there's, there's, there's this binding of the spirit of addiction, you know? So, so, so my thing is, you know, how do we define what spirit is? You know, and then how, how do we define then that does addiction have a spirit? You know, how did we come to the conclusion that we can label it as something as the spirit of addiction? And then uh, how do we find a solution, scripturally speaking, as to, as, to, as to deal with this? And normally the solution would be this, um, you know, we need to bind that demon. We need to bind this demon of addiction. Now, my, my question to those who use this strategy is this. Um, uh, you have been binding it for years and it's just getting worse. <laughs> Who lost it? <laughs> so if, if, if deliverance comes from binding a demon or casting the demon out, and, and, and when we look in scripture, uh, that process can actually do a little bit more harm. Because uh, if the house isn't occupied, the demon then goes and comes back. Now, what does the Bible mean by the house being occupied? And it would then come to, 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 to the next question of how does a demon actually, if it has, if it's in the vessel of a person, how, how is that person actually delivered? And the Bible provides us with the best answer. When we come to salvation, repentance in Christ Jesus, um, the old is gone and new has come. But it's, it's the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit residing in the life of a believer. And where the Holy Spirit resides, is it possible then for a demon to live in the same room then with the Holy Spirit that is all powerful? Mm -hmm. So true deliverance then would actually come from the person repenting and coming to salvation and not just the binding of a demon. Um, yeah, so I hope that. Uh, Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Just in a related matter, um, there seems to be a sector of Christian believers, presumably they're believers, they've associated any mental or emotional or personality condition with demonic activity. They don't seem to recognize that there's anything other than that. It's yeah. considered a physiological problem. Yeah, and, and, and the challenge with that concept is 
the response that 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 the church that holds such a view then um the message of the bible then becomes some sort of a genie in the bottle mm -hmm. that is just there to help aid whatever you have instead of using strategies to bring some sort of accountability of where does this stem from how do i change this moving forward you know god is now used as this person that's just there to just change any aspect of your life and the whole concept of christianity then becomes a bit just well, not a bit distorted greatly distorted in, in, in that matter um and then it becomes unclear even to some especially for us they want to share the gospel message is um you know what gospel message are you coming with you know is it is now then categorized in certain categories and stuff and um, god is this genie in the bottle ready to aid whatever the person wants and it's never the message about repentance and salvation you know um entering a relationship with god uh in spite of the shortcomings that you have um and, and and whereas we should actually be as the church being able to help people with those conditions in a in a practical way uh, so i'm not it's not saying that prayer doesn't change things it's saying that what does it look like for the process of prayer changing things mm -hmm. you know i i can't help but think about james um is there, is there any sick among you call upon the elders of the church you know and there's that term again the elders of the church we have to define who's the elders of the church and lay hands on them and that's what we see today you know, the laying on our hands but then there's also the 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 pouring on of oil and then there's the question of what is the oil that he's speaking of because if, if it's the oil of exodus chapter 30 the anointing oil according to the concept that god gives it was one bottle so is it the anointing oil because that oil would have only been used for Aaron, his sons, uh, the tabernacle. Um, but is it something else? I'll give you another example. Um, when we find the story of the Good Samaritan, he brings some sort of a first aid to him in helping him because he, he pours oil on his wounds, he bandages him up. So he offers some sort of a, a first aid, a, a medical assistance. And when we go back to James, James says, and the prayer of faith will heal the sick. For us as the church, our faith is in, in, in our relationship with God. But what does praying for the sick also have to do? We have to help and aid and care for that person, offer some sort of medical assistance. And that doesn't take away our faith. That is because of our faith. I see you've had these conversations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 we are on, uh, that's good. Yeah. We are on 730. There's one more on the chat, which you kind of half answered. So you can probably just be brief or, 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 or reinforce is one of the root causes, not broken families. And of course, yeah. if that's the case, then how do we give attention to that? Yeah. Very, very, very good question. Um, and, and, and I believe this is where the, the church steps in because we can't we, we, we we're not able to change every everybody's family settings so this is why our, our program strategically does certain events to allow families to be a part of it so for an example um, in order to visit your loved one you have your formal visitation day uh, at the recovery program and uh, so once they, they they're in our program we don't call them addicts anymore we call them our loved ones you know so so in order to visit your loved one that is in the recovery program you get your visitation day but outside of the visitation day there is services that our church offers such as wednesday's bible study and sunday's church so the family gets exposure to the message as well and and and, and you know with, with our calendar i think in the next two months we're going to be doing and covering uh, certain topics in the bible such as family worship you know, what does it mean for a man to be the head of a home? Uh, what, what is the role of a mother? What is the role of parents? What is the role of, cho of, of children? So throughout the six months that they are with us, them along with their family would have had exposure to teachings like that from the biblical worldview and some sort of an engagement and also family support with that. The challenge is not all of the families attend services, not all of the families want to go through some sort of spiritual upliftment uh, and that's where the challenge comes because now you leave that family so how do we change that or what do we do in order to to, to aid that um we encourage the person so before the person is is released from us and this process starts from the third month so the program is six months so from the third month towards the sixth month we start this reintegration process so if the person doesn't have good family support 
we have to establish some sort of support within our church or within the church that they'll be released to. So they might not have that support from families, but they need to then find that support from family or other systems that is outside there. And we help walk that journey and establish such sort of relationships before the person even is released from us. Then what we also do is we offer long-term accountability. So outside of them being with us for six months, they have another six months after that. So in actual fact, the program now seems to be uh, 12 months rather than just six months. So it's six months in-house. And then it's once they are at home, uh, they have to still come for support groups. They still have to come for Bible studies and they still have to attend church. So they, if they might not receive the support from their family at home, they are still a family of the body of Christ. And we as the body of Christ have to accept them like our family and be ready to care for them now. So that's just one of the ways that we use to bridge that gap. Thank you. Um, I said, I think, yeah, we, I mean, we passed, uh, we passed 7.30 now. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>